from Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's the NFC wild card playoff game between the Chicago Bears and the Philadelphia Eagles. Wild indeed, as the Bears return to the playoffs for the second time in three seasons. The weapons they brought with them were intensity and confidence. They fought the Eagles on terms that were as furious as they were equal. The Bears had come through the 70s knowing they were a team on the rise, with their best football still ahead of them. an offense that had outscored any Bear team in 14 years, Chicago fashioned a slim 17-10 halftime lead. As the decade ended, the Bears had gained the NFL power level, that raises edge where championships are decided by one or two key plays. Now the Bears, 86 yards away from the distant goal line at this end, will line it up. They send Ricky Watts wide to the near side. Bashnagel wide to the right. In motion back towards the line is Bashnagel. Phipps hands to Pink on a sweep to the right side. He's got a convoy of blockers, but a penalty flag is thrown. Hayden breaks free. He might score. He's to the 50. Down the first sideline, pump the ankle, he breaks through. And he goes all the way inside the 20 to 15 and 10 to 5. He dances into the end zone. But a flag was thrown all the way back at the 15-yard line. Chicago saw its second-half efforts cast away. For Philadelphia, fortunes were quite different. Dorothy, with the call, drops back to pass. He has time, throws it out the right side. It's caught by Hempfield. He's across the 50, the 45, the 40. He's going to score! Indeed, the Eagles would emerge 27-17 victors that day, but the Bears would carry a new resolve from Philadelphia into 1980. Their goal, to be in Soldier Field for the playoffs. Neil Armstrong leads the Bears into the 80s. They will be a blend of experience, ambition, determination. Men of resourcefulness. Men of skill. Lessons of youth behind them. The Bears finished the 1979 season as the highest scoring team in the NFC Central and with a defense that had gone from 22nd to 6th in the league in two short years. They finished the 70s as a closely knit team backed by a loyal legion. Early season victories had become a bare trademark in recent seasons. They come ready to play. The Packers fell victim to Chicago defense on opening day. On the ensuing Sunday, 
the Bear offense was in high gear against the Vikings. Fitz Evans, the quarterback. And he play action fakes, drops back to throw. He unwinds a long one down the field for Scott. He's open, he's got it. Touchdown! Big blocks got Walla Payton into the fast lane as Chicago strutted to a 26 to 7 triumph. In friendly Soldier Field, they had drawn first blood from two divisional foes. Confident and undefeated, the Bears sought victories on the road. Looking to Dallas, Chicago's elder statesman, Alan Page, analyzed the Bears' stiffest test. I think we have to play, defensively, we have to play consistently. Uh, just play the defense and do our job and not get rattled when things go bad. Uh, because if we hang in there, uh, our chances are just as good as theirs. I really feel like, uh, you know, the game is ours until they take it away from us. While veteran Page contemplated the Bears' chances, safety Doug Plank couldn't wait for the big game. As far as an organization goes, Dallas seemed like they were always on top. I'm not going to have a very hard time at all getting 100% ready to play the Cowboys this weekend. The high-performance offense of the defending NFC champion Cowboys was left sputtering much of the afternoon as Bears barged in on Roger Starbuck. Yet another connection to James Scott gave the Bears a fourth quarter lead. But with less than two minutes remaining, Starbuck and receiver Tony Hill dealt Chicago a tough road defeat. A mid-year slump, plus the hospitalization of Evans with a rare staph infection, left their spirits as damp as a Midwestern rainstorm. Despite the conditions, the Bears came out throwing. A 54-yard patent to Brian Bashnagel surprise launched Chicago on a month-long touchdown spree. With 27 points on the scoreboard and victory but 13 seconds away, the Bears were handed another heartache at the season's halfway point. It was a defeat that would crush most teams, but this was to be a special Bear team. All but written off, the Bears had something to prove. Midway through the year, Chicago's quest for victory became a drive to the playoffs. The offensive line of center Dan Neal, tackles Ted Albrecht and Dennis Lick, and guards Reedy Sori and Noah Jackson blazed a trail for perhaps the NFL's most gifted runner, number 34, Walter Payton. Stripped of the team's top three fullbacks because of injuries and saddled with a bruised shoulder, all Peyton could manage was over 1,600 yards. His fourth consecutive NFC rushing title and seven more bare records. His 16 touchdowns led the entire NFC. Whether he's out there slashing in the noonday sun, jackknifing in a heated indoor arena, 
or polishing his routine for the ice capades, no one does it better than Walter Payton. Perhaps Payton's ability and his outstanding season can best be exemplified on a simple screen pass against Tampa Bay. After making the catch, Payton burned off the first 25 yards to the first wave of Buck defenders, then glided while waiting for blocking help before catapulting into the end zone. If you were young and already the NFL's eighth leading rusher, you would smile too. But unlike the movie title, the Bears are no longer a force of one. They are a team of death. When Major League fullbacks, Roland Harper, John Skabinski, and Robin Earl went down, number 22, Dave Williams, switched to fullback and performed remarkably well. In addition to being a running threat, Williams led the Bears with five touchdown catches. Speedy James Scott has proven his game-breaking skills over the last three years. But when Scott and Golden Richards were lost to injury, Chicago had depth at those positions too. One able reserve was Brian Bashnagel. Another who helped pave the way to the playoffs was number 80, Ricky Watts. 24 catches over a season is certainly not an eye-opening statistic, unless one considers all 24 were made in the final six weeks of the year. Many feel that Watts, the Tulsa speedster, has superstar potential. Depth is more than insurance against injury. Greg Latta has come up with big plays as a regular for three seasons. But now Latta alternates with number 87, Mike Cobb, a punishing blocker turned determined receiver. The revitalized offense shot the Bears to a 7-1 finish, the best in the NFL over the season's last eight games. The Bears play defense well because they play it as a team. In 1979, they allowed the third fewest points in the NFL and recorded two shutouts. Defensive ends Mike Hardenstein and rookie Dan Hampton, number 99, were vital contributors. Hampton was the first Chicago rookie starter in five years. The leader of the defense is 13-year veteran Alan Page. Page remains a premier defensive tackle, and his ex-teammates in Minnesota realized all too well why he was selected to the all-star team of the decade. Page shared the club lead in sacks with tackle Jim Osborne, and the Bears possessed once more a fearsome defensive front. Over the past three seasons, Chicago has completely rebuilt its linebacking core, a time period that coincides with the rise of Bear victories. Tom Hicks in the middle and number 59, Gary Campbell, are big play types. Chicago's leading tackler was a man who nailed the opposition 111 times, number 58, Jerry Muckenstern. But the Bears of the 80s will go on without Captain Doug Buffon, a Chicago fixture for a decade and a half. Announcing his retirement in December, Buffon leaves the Chicago defense a legacy that includes dedication to team and a whatever-it-takes attitude. Buffon's absence in the 80s will be eased somewhat because the Bears have a secondary that led the NFC in interceptions with 29. 
Virgil Livers was one thieving cornerback, as was former All-Pro Alan Ellis. Recovered from knee surgery, Ellis managed to pick off four while playing in only five of the last six games. Terry Schmidt tied for the club high, stealing six, including one for a touchdown. Lenny Waltershide, the Bears' nickel back, proved to be a deadly tackler throughout 1979. Waltershide was a ready reserve and complimented one of the best pairs of safety men in the league. Gary Fensick grabbed six interceptions, a career high, but faces a comeback season from knee and ankle surgeries in 1980. Doug Plank, like the others, a renowned hitter, intercepted three to round out a solid bear defense. A consistent 84-point performance by Bob Thomas would aid the Bears along the playoff road, as would Bob Parsons, who led the NFL in placing kicks inside the 20. Still, one vital playoff ingredient was missing, but not for long. A pro for nine years, Michael Elston Phipps took control of Chicago's destiny in dramatic fashion. In week nine, the Bears trailed the 49ers by six late in the final quarter. Fans listening at home wondered if Phipps could save the day. Nice bagel in the slot to the near right side. The tight end is Lana on the left, Deuce backfield. Fourth down, almost 10 to go. Phipps sets his line. He drops back to throw. Has time. Throws it deep for Scott. He's got it at the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5. He's going to score. Touchdown, James Scott. The victory was sweet, but perhaps even the Bears themselves could not foresee their marvelous future. The Detroit Lions were next to fall. Special teams A. Steve Schubert raced 77 yards, and the Bears were 35 to 7 wins. After spotting the ultimate NFC champion Rams, a 16-point lead, again Phipps brought victory. Phipps to throw on first down. Looking deep for Watts, one-on-one, -on -one. Cromwell falls down, Watts makes the catch, he's going to score! Cromwell got his feet crossed up, he fell down. Watts waited for the ball, but it goes in on the first play, a 68-yard touchdown pass. After a win over the Jets came the Bucks. The Bears appear to have the rush on. They do. Blowing up the middle and blocking the ball. His turn is picked off in the air by Lee Coons. He's to the five. He's down to the two-yard line. First and goal Bears. Chicago's defense was awesome, shutting out Tampa in its own backyard. Green Bay fell in week 15. Play action fake Dickey. Lots of high in the air. And it's intercepted. Hit by Hicks. He may score a touchdown. He's got a convoy. The Bears had crushed six of seven opponents. Yet when the Chicago Express was at full throttle, tragedy struck. George Hallis Jr., mugs to even those who knew him casually, died of a sudden massive heart attack. President of the team for 17 years, Muggs would have surely loved December 16, 1979. Despite the shocking loss, a swirling 30-mile-an-hour wind and a freezing snow-covered turf. The Bears would perform like superheroes. At stake was a playoff berth. If Armstrong's men could win by 33 points and the Cowboys could defeat Washington, the Bears would be playoff bound. It happened precisely that way. Against St. Louis, the Bears scored early and often as Mike Phipps continued his stellar play. Dave Williams did the rest.
Williams cruised in from 10 yards out, and the Bear offensive line cleared wide thoroughfares for a pair of Peyton touchdown struts. The defense would allow but six points all afternoon. Points Ricky Watts quickly offset with one mighty burst. High and over Ender, drifting to the far side, and it's going to be Watts up the sidelines to the 20, the 25, cuts back to the 30, upfield to the 35, breaks a tackle at the 40. He's up to the 50. He's going to block. He's to the 35, the 30. He might go. Down to the 15, the 10, 5, touchdown. He caught the ball on the far sideline to the 18-yard line, and Motors up the far sideline, 72 yards for the kickoff return, like an 82 yards. Watts and the Bears weren't through. Before that afternoon was over, Chicago would annihilate the Cardinals 42 to six. In the waning moments of the game, Peyton closed in on his fourth consecutive NFC rushing title, and the Bears closed in on the playoffs. A team that was an unfortunate three and five midway through the season had earned a playoff berth. Neil Armstrong knew how far they had come. They've learned to play together, and I think they've learned that they've learned how to win. Earlier in the year, you know, we, we were still learning, but uh, I mean, they were willing, and I think that that's really a tribute to to all the people in this organization. The fact that we, despite a lot of injuries, uh, our guys never did give up. Into the 80s, venture the Chicago Bears. By virtue of their grand finish in 1979, it is no wonder Bear fans greet the coming decade with enthusiasm.